you for joining us today for Art Break. It's lovely to see all of your faces. Um, I have an announcement before we get started, and then I'm going to introduce our speakers for today. Um, so this Thursday, April 11th, we have a great talk coming up with Dr. James Dennison, who is the postdoctoral fellow with the KIA and, the Cal and Kalamazoo College. Um, so he is going to give a talk entitled Hogan Minded, Race and Place in Georgia O'Keeffe's Southwest. And this talk explores the ways in which O'Keeffe's New Mexican paintings engaged with Southwestern indigenous tribes. Uh, so the talk is free to attend, but we do encourage pre-registration on our website. Um, if there are flyers over here, there are flyers at the front desk. So if you're interested, please grab one. We would love to see you back here on Thursday. So just a little uh, background on the Kirk Newman Art School before we, before we begin. Uh, the art school began in 1923 when the forerunner to the KIA, the Kalamazoo chapter of the Federation of Arts, offered its first classes. Today, the art school has grown to offer nearly 500 classes taught by 60 to 80 faculty and welcomes approximately 3,400 annual enrollments. The scholarship program in the school aims to make the school more financially accessible. Students of all ages and ability levels have access to a range of art departments and art making opportunities, including ceramics, drawing, fiber, glass, jewelry, painting, photography and digital media, printmaking and sculpture. Uh, each offers well equipped studios and resources that rival many college and university arts programs. In addition to its many class offerings, beloved programs of the school include its visiting artist program, the off-site Anagama Kiln, the holiday art sale, the hands-on event, and of course, the post-baccalaureate residency program. The residency program launched in 2015 as a way to provide recent college graduates with an opportunity to build a body of work within a supportive community of artists and a studio environment. The residency program is generally focused on studio time, professional development, and community engagement. Since 2015, uh, the program has proudly supported nearly 50 emerging artists, and we are thrilled to add our 2024 residents to the growing list of artists who have participated in this program. Um, and we are introducing two more of those to you today. Um, so I will introduce both speakers, and then I will turn the mic over to the both of you. Um, so first up, we will have Marianne Robertson. Marianne is a fiber artist and weaver. She graduated from Western Michigan University with a degree in education and early childhood development. Robertson is inspired by how weaving can combine art, history, and practicality. And our second speaker today is Kenny Dankert. Uh, she's our printmaking resident. Um, she earned her MFA at the University of Arizona. She spent the last two decades developing her career as a multidisciplinary artist and educator. And her practice centers material accessibility, and explores concepts of memory, the embodiment of home, and American aesthetics of nostalgia. We also have one more art break coming up next week that features our last two residents. So please join us for that one as well um, on Tuesday, April 16th to hear from the final two members of our 2024 cohort. I will turn it over to you now, Marianne. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming today. My name is Mary Ann Robertson, and I am the Fiber Arts Resident here at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Today, I will be talking about my background as an artist, some of my influences and past works, my experiences here as I complete my residency, and my future goals. Just a little bit about me, I grew up in Kalamazoo and went to Western Michigan University for elementary education and early childhood development. I got married to my wonderfully supportive husband and had two children who are the absolute lights of my life. You can see here, they are budding fiber artists themselves. I started my fiber arts journey 17 years ago here at the KIA. I was 19 years old in college and my friend asked if I wanted to take a drawing or painting class with him. We looked at the KIA classes together 
And when I saw that they offered floor loom weaving, I was a goner. I could not believe that that was something that I could do. That there was a basement full of floor looms that I could learn to take yarn and make it into fabric. It was like magic to me. I abandoned my friend in his drawing class, sorry Chad, um, and signed up for floor loom weaving with Gretchen Huggett, and I never looked back. Gretchen is an amazing teacher, artist, and friend, and I highly recommend her class. In the photo on the right, which was about 16 years ago, one of my scarves was on display here at the KIA along with some others, and I was beyond excited. It was my first work that would ever be on display. Um, the one on the left is another picture from around the same time, 16 years ago. Before I move on, I'd like to give you a quick overview of weaving on a floor loom. First, the planning stage, choosing yarn, calculating size, doing a bunch of math, um, planning your project. Next is measuring the yarn. To do this, I like to use a warping board. The length between each peg is a yard, so this project is three and a half yards. Next, you wind the yarn onto the back beam and thread each strand through a tiny metal heddle and through the reed. Next is throwing the shuttle. Each pass of the shuttle adds one strand of yarn to your fabric. And of course, here is the final project. Um, this is a time-lapse video of weaving in action. I am pressing down, here, let me start it. <laughs> I am pressing down on the foot pedals to raise different threads as I weave. This creates pattern in the fabric. In these last 17 years of weaving, I've had times of weaving every day and stretches of time with no weaving, but I've always come back. I've also collected quite a few looms. Some would say more looms than I need. <laughs> but Gretchen once assured me that too many looms is always exactly one more than whatever you currently have. So I'm still good. <laughs> so meet my looms. This is Steve, <laughs> Pamela, Corey, Ellen, and Brenda. <laughs> Each loom is named after the weaver who owned it before, which is a common practice in weaving. I love this tradition because it honors the weavers that came before and creates a connection between generations of weavers. Um, next up are my influences and what drives me to create. Since starting this residency, I've been thinking a lot about what is leading me to create. I really want to be genuine and figure things out. So I started with going back to why I like weaving in the first place. Weaving is art, but it's also practical. Necessity is the mother of invention. People invented weaving cloth thousands of years ago. Weaving is structure, math, and strength. My soul loves the pattern and repetition of weaving. Weaving is taking many strands of yarn and bringing them all together to create something new and strong. People have been weaving throughout history and I love thinking of those who came before me using much the same process that I use today. Next, I'd like to share some of my past works. And first, I'd like to go all the way back to my very first project the sampler that I made 17 years ago here at the KIA. It's very beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> I remember asking Gretchen how to fix the edges and realizing that I actually had to make the edges look nice while weaving and not after the fact. But I love going back to the beginning and seeing how we all start in the same place. Um, moving on, I've also gone through a tartan phase 
um, that I guess I'm still in the middle of. <laughs> Scottish tartans are very specific patterns that are associated with different family clans. So specific tartans can be recognized as belonging to specific families. I love how this connects history, art, and family. These tartans are from the Sinclairs on the, the top green ones, <laughs> the Bedfords, which is the gray, and the Robertsons in the red. Here are a few more of my past projects. I really love making scarves, shawls, and ponchos. I've also done towels, table runners, placemats, blankets, bags, and more. Um, the maroon is a silk scarf that I wove, which I'm pretty sure still holds the record for having the most broken threads ever in the weaving class downstairs. <laughs> broken threads are a big pain to fix, but I do love how it turned out. Um, also, the purple is a table runner. I was working on and I have my favorite poncho. I used making a technique called clasp weft, where you hook two kinds of yarn together in the middle so each side is a different color. Uh, the green and blue are two more table runners. The green is called summer and winter because each side is the opposite of the other. Um, the blue I love because it has the older vintage style. The two shawls I made as well. The maroon is called a Mobius wrap, and the purple is a hook lace pattern. Here are some rainbow placemats I made, which I was beyond excited to sell at the KIA holiday sale. Um, another scarf and two wool baby blankets that I made for friends. Um, the blue and purple blanket I especially love because the stripe pattern is actually the baby's birth date with the number of threads in each stripe equaling the corresponding month, day, and year of the baby's birthday. Working on these projects over the years has led me back here to the KIA and the residency. My experience here during the residency has been very fulfilling. I've enjoyed time in the weaving, stu the weaving studio, both learning and teaching, and I've been able to take a few classes that have really helped me grow as an artist. First, of course, I've been taking floor loom weaving with Gretchen Huggett. Honestly, I have taken this class so many times after the <laughs> over the past 17 years. The class has a range of students from beginning, from beginners to experts. So I'm not the only one taking it over and over again. The community of weavers that I found there is what really brings me back again and again. Discussing projects, learning, teaching, and creating together with the community of weavers in this studio has honestly been one of the great joys of my life. Also this year, I took rug hooking with Martha Rosenfeld. I had never done rug hooking before, but I truly enjoyed it. Rug hooking uses a frame with a piece of linen stretched over. You use thin strips of fabric, traditionally wool, and use a hook to pull up short loops of fabric through the weave of the linen. Martha is a lovely person and teacher, and I enjoyed learning from her. I've also been able to apply her lessons on composition and color in my work, which has been great for my collection. It was also recommended to me to take a class that is out of my fiber comfort zone. Well, nothing is further out of my comfort zone than drawing the class my friend wanted me to take with him 17 years ago. So I nervously signed up for drawing with David Yeider, and it turned out that I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend his class. As you can tell, I am certainly not claiming to be an expert, but drawing was a skill that I had skipped over as an artist, and I really enjoyed going back to learn more about that skill. 
It's been giving me a new appreciation for drawing and a different way of looking at things. Of course, a big part of the residency is working on a collection of work. I've been working on a collection of weavings using a technique called Theo Mormon, named after Theo Mormon, the woman who devised the technique. With Theo Mormon, you have two warps, which is like two layers of yarn, one for the fabric and one for the inlay on top. Here are two examples of Theo Mormon pieces I did a few years ago, one with a flower inlay and one with a tree inlay. With my current projects, I've been exploring with different inlay mediums, yarn and strips of cloth photos. For these, I printed photos on fabric, cut the fabric into strips, and then wove the photos back together. A technique I saw used by another weaver, Daryl Lancaster, along with using the original Theo Mormon technique. The photo strips end up being the inlay on top of the woven fabric, so there is a structural fab fabric holding everything together on the bottom with the photo on top. All the pieces in my current collection have two warps, the two layers, the structural fabric and the inlay on top. And they are accomplishing two very different things. The ground warp is structured and practical and holding everything together. The inlay warp is completely different. It is not holding any of the cloth together. It is floating on top. And because it doesn't have to hold anything together, it can move around and be playful and fun. And though I love the structure and rules of weaving, I am loving playing with the whimsical too. So this collection is really inspired by the duality of weaving. It's mathematical, repetitive, and structured, but also whimsical and playful. Having a home studio, being able to weave every day, doing this residency, working as an artist, having a show. These were all dreams that I never thought that I could have. And now I'm here thinking, what comes next? What new dreams do I have? I'd love to continue weaving every day and selling projects. I've also harbored a maybe not so secret dream of teaching at the KIA someday. And I've started thinking about pitching a kid's fiber arts class to maybe take place next fall. <laughs> I love working with kids and have done weaving with preschoolers and Girl Scout troops. They've always been so interested and I love to share my love for fiber arts with the next generation. Thank you so much for attending today. I truly appreciate you all taking the time to listen to us. The Residence Art Show has an opening reception on Friday, May 3rd and is up all of May. We'd love to see you there. Does anyone have any questions for me? How yes? long do you typically spend on a project? Like start to finish weaving some of your pieces? What's the general timeline? Um, she asked for a timeline on how long it takes me to create some of these pieces. That is a good question. It, <laughs> I never know quite how to answer because it takes me a very long time. Um, usually from start to finish, if I'm weaving, if I'm weaving every day, it's taking me still a couple of weeks to finish a project. I usually put a large amount of yarn on the loom so that I can, setting up the loom will take the, long, the longest amount of time. So then I can weave for a long time on one warp. Thanks. Yes? Where do you get your yarn from? Do you ever dye it yourself? Oh, yes. Um, he asked where I get my yarn and if I dye it myself. Um, I have not dyed yarn myself yet, but I would love to. I feel like that's um, a logical next step for me to try out. <laughs> um, I buy a lot of my yarn online from, let's see, various places, from Yarn Barn of Kansas, Webs, 
um, the Woolery. There's also a place in Kalamazoo that I'm blanking on the name of. Thank you. Great Northern Weaving um, is another place in Kalamazoo, a great place to buy some yarn. Thank you. Yes? Do you have a favorite like fiber content or um, type of yarn you like to use for projects, or does it depend on what project you're doing? Um, she asked if I have a favorite type of yarn. I, I do have to say my favorite to work with is cotton. Um, I really enjoy working with cotton. It's very strong. It's a very soft. Um, sometimes they tease me in the studio because I also really like neutrals. If you're asking colors of yarn that I like, I love a neutral. <laughs> I love a beige. Um, love cotton. Um, wool is also great to work with. Thank you. Any other questions? Great, well, thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to my fellow resident, Kenny. Have to adjust this a little bit. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kenny. I am the resident printmaker here at the KIA, and I am an interdisciplinary artist. Um, a lot of my work has to do with home, the body, objects that connect us to family. Um, um, a lot of my work has to do with memory, um, feeling um, in two places at once. Um, which is inspired by my background, which I will share with you now. Um, I am from Kalamazoo. I lived here until I was nine years old. I moved to Arizona with my mom, um, and my familial space is a collage space. Uh, I come from a family of makers. Um, my stepmom is an auto mechanic. My dad has worked in label manufacturing for most of his life and has seen the progression from uh, manual to more digital types of printing on a commercial level. And so that um, printing in the, in the space of the factory in that manufactured space is also very inspirational to me. Um, my mom is a cosmetologist, hairdresser. I spent a lot of time in the salon with her growing up as well. So hair cutting um, and I also lived with my grandma for a period of time and she crocheted everything and sewed um, Halloween costumes. She also sewed some costumes here for the, the clowns in the Duda parade back in the day. Um, Ruth, I'm very lucky to have had her as an inspiration growing up. Um, so I moved to Arizona and I got my BFA in 2016 in printmaking. Um, and spent some time in Flagstaff also co-teaching in a screen printing program and then moved to Tucson in 2018 and got my MFA in 2022. I was also an instructor of record there for um, the body and figure drawing. And I've included, so I just came back to Kalamazoo basically after 20 years, just two years ago. And it made perfect sense to do a residency here at the KIA. Um, this is a place I remember being awestruck by as a kid, and some of my first um, witnessing of art was here. Um, I first got back and spent time flower farming. I now work in coffee as well, um, and I've included some pictures of my dog, Ollie, and my cat, Shippy, because they're very important to me. So uh, material and aesthetic inspiration uh, for my work. I spent a lot of time in thrift stores, um, collecting things on the sidewalk and dumpsters, looking at patterns in both manufactured and living things, and sort of noticing the similarities and differences between the two. I'm really interested in souvenir objects, um, and I work a lot with personal photographic archives. Um, so a lot of my work is narrative and collaged and 
incorporates a lot of different mediums. I'm really inspired by digging into the aesthetics of American nostalgia and unpacking what that means, how nostalgia is both a connective and disruptive force in daily life. Um, how do you miss something and also be present? And I'm also interested in all things camp and glamour. <laughs> so to go through some of my previous work and kind of my background in printmaking, um, I work a lot with alternative processes. I like printing on fabric, so, and I tend to obsess over objects. Um, so this is uh, a reconstruction of a nightgown, which was my grandmother's. She passed away in 2018, or I'm sorry, 2012. Um, and this is like one of the only things I have of hers. And it's something that is, um, yeah, I, I'm interested or was interested in, in just drawing it over and over again. So I have, and then, so the center image is a trace monotype. It's a drawing basically done, um, you lay down a um, ink on a piece of plexiglass and then a piece of paper. And I looked at the nightgown and did a drawing with a ballpoint pen and it transferred the ghost image of that drawing um, to create this kind of uh, ghost image print of the nightgown. Um, I've experimented with collage and the digital space with uh, some of those monotypes as well. And then on the left, I decided to do like a reconstruction of the nightgown altogether um, to really explore the object um, on a tactile level and inscribe it with new meaning. Um, a lot of my imagery is layered in space. So this is a series called Home is Here and There, um, one through six. So I was basically layering images of my daily life in Tucson with places of home taken from uh, interior spaces and backyards of family spaces here in Kalamazoo and kind of layering those together and imagining being in two places at once. Um, while I was in graduate school, I wanted to reconsider imagery um, because printmaking is a time consuming process. You're really like digging into an image and spending a lot of time with it. So. I wanted to step back altogether and just go back to the simple act of looking and what kinds of things am I looking at and spaces. So this was helpful for that. Here are some um, close-up images. I've also done some installation work um, just in arranging household objects. So um, this one is called Domestic Daydream. It's an installation I did of arranged door stoppers and um, fan blade surface with a uh, photo print. And then um, more recently, this piece was kind of an exercise in memory mixing um, and just bringing more playfulness into my Installative work, uh, it's called Vacation Bible School. And um, it's also considering like the space of the phone as a souvenir object, a place that holds um, memory and experience and um, kind of, you know, expanding on that as somewhat of a religious experience and also kind of incorporating some of my sense of humor, um, which is something I've long um, wish to incorporate into my work. So my thesis of uh, body of work was titled Stay in Touch. And this was during the Pandemic, it took a little bit of extra time for me to finish my program. Um, it's hard to, um, I ended up totally redirecting 
my work, um, it was, you know, respectively uh, a difficult time for everybody. And so I wanted to just be in that. Um, I also was working with video during my time in the program. Um, so the central piece is a video piece called FOMO. Um, it's an eight minute video that is sort of a collage of screensaver imagery and somewhat of a montage of my daily life um, through the years. I think it's a collection of footage from over five years um, that I imposed um, with a green screen bodily performance. Um, I was spending a lot of time in my, my phone and the virtual space. And so this show is kind of about um, thinking about both the limiting and unhealthy aspects of that, uh, while also kind of honoring the phone as a space of tenderness. Um, the phone has been a connected force for me through the years, being connected to my family long distance. And so um, I was really thinking about that while I was out there at that time. The prints are um, embroidered screen prints. Um, so some of the imagery uh, is basically um, stills pulled from the video uh, that I created into uh, screen prints and then hand embroidered, uh, which was very important to bring that digital experience into a more physical tactile space. I also did like green screen embroidery on the video. So there's an illusion of that as well. Here are a couple of stills to show the embroidered green screen work. And um, just to give you a sense of the type of imagery that I was looking at. Um, I was also then working a lot with just digital collage. So again, imposing images of home, um, respectively from both um, the Arizona landscape and out here in Michigan. Um, that center image of the window is called um, living room window goes for a dip. Um, so I'm trying to incorporate some humor in it as well. On the right side, it's two photos, or sorry, yeah, two photos imposed over each other, of like a, a mountain landscape. Uh, with my parents, like two glasses of um, nighttime beverage. And um, here is an installation view of my collage work. So I like to hang with magnets and sort of reference um, what's happening in the photographic space with the installation as well. And so um, being here, um, I've been able to explore kind of a return to the space of printmaking um, and kind of unpacking what that means for me. And again, thinking about um, manufactured versus like living objects. Um, Printmaking kind of combines both of those things for me. So it is kind of a machine meets body experience, but then I'm able to um, incorporate organic mark making. And I find that to be a very satisfying process. I was able to take intaglio printmaking with Hank Matson, um, which was a nice way to just be free and abstraction and um, explore mark making. Um, Basically, this is uh, just using like a needle point tool on a copper plate and then wiping ink into those recessed areas and printing. Um, you can see the development of the image from left to right. I was also able to um, 
sort of co-teach or assist in Deb's uh, intro to lithography, um, which was a wonderful experience. And I had a couple of plates that did not work out for me. So um, I traditionally worked in lithography um, on, on the stone. So I attempted a plastic plate um, inspired by this digital collage on the left and uh, a metal plate uh, drawing inspired by this um, cloud photo um, that is just a random photo I found in my family archives. Um, that one also didn't work out. <laughs> um, I think it's important and print is always like a very humbling space. Um, there are so many things that can, can go wrong and it's always uh, worth it. I found um, the process of photogravure to be very satisfying. I took that with David Jones, assisted by Mary Whelan. Um, and I decided to re-explore some imagery that I took back in 2020, where I brought these objects, um, basically thrifted objects of the home out into natural setting um, and kind of thinking about the difference again between natural and manufactured space. So here are some more images um, pulled from plates that I made and have started to explore um, with colored pencil and embroidery. Sorry, let me go back. Yeah, so on the right side, you can see um, I decided to go in with some embroidery on the blinds image, and then um, I went back and uh, did some color pencil work on this one. Um, the print is usually the first part of the process. I always love putting my hand back in it. Um, here's another mirror image of the original photograph and an accidental negative that I printed, which I ended up liking quite a bit. And um, another image of these silver gloves um, I've used in a lot of my photo and video work as a kind of metaphor for um, feeling disconnected or a yearning to connect to space and place. And going back to these images through the space of print has offered a new perspective and sense of meaning for the photographs. Um, it usually takes me a while to unpack my own work. So I sit with archives and print offers a slow space of making um, where I'm able to revisit photographs and think more deeply about the meaning. And so, you know, I've sort of come to realize a lot of this photographic work that I've been referencing really just has to do with missing home for a long time. And um, coming to understand that home is embodied and has to do with being present in your current surroundings. And um, yeah, so it's it's been a, an emotional experience being back here in Kalamazoo and uh, slightly overwhelming and invaluable. And um, it, like I said, takes me a while to unpack my work. So I'm, I'm still moving through it slowly and I'm finding a lot of joy in that. Um, moving forward, some other processes, Oops, sorry, <laughs> moving forward, some other, I have a lot of things kind of coming together right now. Um, these prints, these crocheted um, vines and leaves and thrifted beads and little shards of brick and broken plastic and glass. 
this photograph of the clouds that I can't let go of, um, a screen door frame that I found on my street where I live now, and um, this fish tank uh, from my parents' house, which I have just inherited. Um, all of these materials and print processes that I've been able to explore here at the KIA, um, I envision coming together to create a body of work uh, tentatively titled Homecoming, which just encapsulates about everything that I kind of reeled off to you today. So body, place, home, memory, um, and all these objects and processes that are both personal and impersonal kind of coming together to create um, a narrative that's personal, but also kind of accessible. Um, hopefully there are things in my work that folks can find relatable and um, start to dig into those questions for themselves. Um, I would also love to continue my journey in being an educator. I miss teaching quite a bit, so um, I would love to teach here at the KIA. Um, and yeah, teaching is also a daily practice for me, so I find a lot of joy in that. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it a lot. Um, my website and Instagram are up here for you. And yeah, thank you all for listening. I didn't ask if any of you have questions. Sorry about that. Does anyone have questions for me? Yeah. Do you see maybe the thread is what is tying everything together? Is this kind of maybe visually roadmap of your work between different locations, different places that you're working, it all seems strung together? Or that same kind of common practice over that? Yeah, so she was asking about um, thread being a common practice among my work, and um, I would say yes. I think assemblage and usually through embroidery and thread work um, is a common practice in my work. It's like the ultimate symbol of, to me, it's a, a meditative act to embroider and it helps me to feel present in my body. And it's also a like visual metaphor of, yeah, connecting to things physically and also signifying even in some of these images, which almost look manufactured um, in some of my collage work, that that manufactured space and experience is also alterable, I think. Um, which is why I'm not so precious with it usually. But yeah, I would say it's definitely a connecting theme in my work. Yes. Are you drawn to particular colors? And if so, is it because they evoke something in particular? Uh, she's asking about color. Yes, um, color is very important and actually all through undergrad, I only worked in black and white in my printmaking. And I'm really interested in, it's kind of changed with each body of work. I think I find myself drawn uh, in chunks of time to certain colors. So for a while it was silver as this like reflective, color and not color. Um, the more muted colors that I was working with with the nightgown, like that faded blue and the pinks were kind of referencing the body and, and age of objects. Um, and then in a lot of my recent work, I've been thinking a lot about hyper-saturated and hyper-present sort of evocative colors like thinking about technicolor space and digital space. So 
color is very important. And uh, I definitely find myself like going through phases with it. Yeah. yeah. So much of your work seems to encompass your time in Arizona and Michigan. Yeah. If you move to like a third state, do you foresee yourself including aspects of home there to previous work or with these two previous locations? Yeah, I think so. I think um, a lot of my, like the images that I'm working with, for instance, with the photo gravier, um, those aren't even in either space. Those are taken from, um, I was actually in New Mexico with a friend. Um, weirdly enough, we decided to go on a road trip during spring break and on our drive back found out that everything was shutting down. And, um, and so I think it's like, yeah, I think that I kind of use what's in front of me materially and photographically. So um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I think I've lived in close to 30 houses in my 30 years on earth. So yeah, home is a variable place and I think that um I know the desert very well, the Arizona desert specifically, and then Kalamazoo, Southwest Michigan area. So those are very sentimental and I think I'll always kind of nod um, to those aesthetic spaces, but I'll make work from wherever. And I, I'm curious to see if it would shift if I moved out of either of those states. Yes. I hesitate to put this in words, but I know Tucson pretty well. Yes. Kalamazoo. Yes. Don't you think there's a different aesthetic out there? And I don't know if it's related to the brightness of the sun or the clarity of the air or what. Um, asking about the differences in aesthetics between Tucson and Kalamazoo, Michigan area. Um, yeah, it's severely different. Um, it is so bright and sunny every day out there. Colors feel more saturated. Um, there is a lot culturally that impacts the aesthetics of both places respectively. Um, there are a lot of, um, you know, we have the Mexican-American border right there. Um, and there is a vibrancy to that culture and indigenous culture and visibility more predominantly um, in Arizona and Tucson specifically which I appreciate a lot. And um, neon signage and cowboy aesthetics and, um, you know, it's a very fashionable place. Um, and there's- Long vivid orange colors throughout. Vivid orange, sienna and, and blue, the sky is so blue. Um, and Tucson specifically is very, lush compared to other parts of the Arizona desert. It, it's kind of an oasis. Um, a lot of Palo Verde, you know, trees and um, juniper and yeah, giant crawling cacti and things like that. And um, the Midwest has got a different richness to it. I was so excited to lay in grass when I got here. <laughs> And I did, actually. The first thing I did was just lay in grass. Um, there is a softness, um, a soft landing, if you will, is how I was thinking about um, the Midwest and also ecologically. Um, it's, it's kind of scary out there, um, thinking about 20 years from now and then thinking about Michigan, um, all this research about how this is kind of the place, you know, as things progress with climate change, um, this is this is quite a special place to be um, in terms of, you know, what we can expect also in the future and, and sustainable sustainability. Um, yeah. 
long-winded answer there. But I appreciate all of your questions. If that's everything, I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for listening.